you can stay in hyper competent, adrenaline driven, must get this done mode, but you'll actually be accomplishing less and less. You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and this is episode 66. In this episode, I welcome Deborah Vogue. Deborah obtained her MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management. She is a crisis navigation partner with over 30 years of experience as a leadership researcher, executive, and advisor. The Boston Globe profiled Deborah for her outstanding abilities to select talented candidates, motivate and develop employees, and resolve conflicts between people as well as organizations. Her work has been featured in publications like Forbes, Inc., and U.S. News and World Report. Deborah, welcome back to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and get to talk to you again. So last we talked, you brought us through how to navigate a crisis. Mm. And I'll put the link to the show notes for people that did not hear episode 55. But at the end of that episode, we kind of did a little cliffhanger. And I said, I want to have you back to talk about this concept of hypercompetence. But before we dive into that, why don't we just start with you telling people what it is you do? You have such a unique title. Yes, it's a title I completely made up myself. So if nobody's familiar with it, that's understandable. I am a crisis navigation partner and I created this concept, I think about two and a half years ago when I realized that this is what I'd been doing all along, but I just hadn't seen the theme that was interwoven through, you know, the thread that was interwoven through my whole tapestry of career so far. So as a crisis navigation partner, I work with women leaders who are feeling on their own for whatever reason as they go through a crisis or if they're at a crossroads in life. And I work with them to help them lead their way through to the best possible outcome given the circumstances. So some of that is coaching. And then some of it, I tend to take on outsourced research projects from people because one of the definitions of crisis is there's a lot more decisions to make rapidly than there are in everyday life, which is already a lot of decisions to make. And so people will give me a chunk of homework to do and I'll do the homework and bring it back to them and say, okay, here's what I learned. Here are your options. And now you can choose from the options now that you know the pros and cons of each. So I do that, I connect people to resources, I help them strategize about difficult conversations because difficult conversations come up a lot in crises as well. And I ultimately want to help women, although I do this with some men too, but I want to help leaders feel that they don't have to be alone or on their own in that situation. And when I say leaders, Some people are leaders of companies and sometimes they're leaders of teams or groups or their family or the PTA at school or their own doctoral program. It doesn't have to be a leader of a giant organization to qualify, but when I say leaders, I mean people who recognize that they're at choice and how they live their life and career. Sometimes they're on their own because they're the only adult child and they're in the sandwich generation trying to take care of parents or uh, maybe because they are at the top of an organization and it can be lonely at the top and you need a confidential sounding board or maybe because the person is single and so they don't have a life partner to to do these things with so my aim is to be there to support leaders who are on their own for whatever reason in a crisis or at crossroads so they don't have to walk solo to get to the other side in the best possible way. And Deborah, I love the title, Crisis Navigation Partner. And when I think about not just people in a doctoral program, but really people navigating life right now, how reassuring it would be, how safe it would feel 
to have someone who is there to help you navigate whatever it is, big or small, yeah. to just take some of the stress and the anxiety out of making decisions in the current state of the world. Oh gosh, I mean, our, before the pandemic, there were, I forget the statistic, but the number of decisions an average person makes in an average day is just mind boggling. And I know that number must have gone up dramatically, I have, though I haven't found the research studies, because we were all constantly trying to figure out how safe am I in this situation? Should I go to the Staples by myself? Should I order online from the Staples? All these decisions all day long. How do I decide that it's safe to see my loved ones? Anyway, just the pandemic itself is a big crisis and drives up the number of decisions we have to make. Then there's people facing something even on top of that. Decisions can be really overwhelming. Before we started recording, I asked you, hey, we're going to be talking about this concept of hyper competence. And as you're thinking of as we're speaking about making decisions, when you're hyper competent, you really put a lot of energy into decisions, maybe more so than someone who's not hyper competent. And my question for you was, does this relate back to how to navigate a crisis? Or is this just more of uh, understanding your profile so you can make better life decisions? And you said, let's save that for the show. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. I started talking about hypercompetence a long time ago. My idea of hypercompetence, which I'm not really sure is a word, but my idea of it is that when someone is too good at getting things done for their own good, I, hello, hypercompetent. I can drive myself nuts trying to get everything done because it's impossible to get everything done. And, and I started realizing over the 20 years of serving as a leadership and career coach in my own business, how my clients tended to be hyper competent. And I started noticing that they tended to be hyper competent for a few particular reasons. So I started blogging about this and I just got such responses from it. And people were so interested in this concept and I just realized like I figured out another way to identify my audience, you know? These are my people, these hyper competent people. And from that, somehow I landed on the idea to create this diagnostic, are you hyper competent? And if so, how and why quiz. I'm almost embarrassed talking to doctoral students about it because since I worked in academic research as a research associate, I know what goes into really solid assessment development. And I would say that, disclaimer, the competence archetype assessment is somewhere between a Cosmo quiz and a PhD student's research project. <laughs> so, I love that. <laughs> I love that analogy. A little bit better than a Cosmo quiz, but maybe not much. But it's not, you know, I would love to test this on 100,000 people and track them longitudinally and really have data to back up what I'm saying. But I had to come to peace with the fact that that's really not my best career move right at this time. And it's still okay to talk about this topic with people because it really seems to resonate. So, and you have people. to start, you have to start somewhere. Test development starts somewhere. And what I found so interesting about the test was it's short. So it's easy, you know, most people listening to this podcast have probably taken their MBTI or there, there's so many tests out there that go on and on and on, question after question after question for personality and different types of profiles. And I thought, wow, this will be interesting. It's just 10 questions. And so I answer the 10 questions and out pops my profile. And, you know, whether it's a Cosmo quiz or a validated instrument, when someone who's taking it finds meaning in it, there's value, yeah. right? Yeah. What popped out for me was that I was a highly functioning competent and it said, you're either this or you're a recovering type A. And I said, that's exactly what I am. <laughs> for the past five years, I've been trying to recover from my type A personality. Are you done or is that an ongoing process like being a recovering alcoholic? Oh my goodness, that is a daily. Yeah daily task. Yeah. It's daily work. That resonates with me. <laughs> I am the same and it's daily work. And yeah. so tell us more. There's 10 questions and it yep. results in four different profiles. Is that right? Yep. Which are four different types of hyper competent. 
one of which is your type, which is that you're highly functioning competent. And so you're either no longer hyper competent, you never were hyper competent, you're just doing really well at life in your, with your level of competency and you're not making yourself inadvertently miserable in the process of trying to get so much done. No, but Deborah, yeah. that was what happened. Yeah. Why I'm now in recovery. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I did make myself miserable as well as I'm sure many other people. Yes. Yes. I got interested in and involved in the Workaholics Anonymous community. And wow, I mean, the people, <laughs> I thought I, the people there were just so impressive and in so many ways. And also I really recognized myself in feeling like this was getting in my way of joy because I would work and work and work and work in an attempt to finish every single possible thing that I deemed important. And then I would miss out on really important things. And it takes me a lot of self-talk and using tools to stop working every day. <laughs> And I'm sure many of the listeners are nodding their heads. Yes, that's me. And right, the which served them well. It served yes. all of us well. That's how we got this far in life, right? Up to a certain point. It's like that double-edged sword because yeah. when you have a past of successes and you're looking for the causal path here and you're going, well, the harder I worked, the more that paid off. Yes. Okay, then I'll just keep working harder because it should keep paying off and pay off more, but then you hit a point where that is not true anymore. Yes, you no longer get that return. And at the same time, as you're working through life stages and you're evolving, perhaps other things become as important to you as work, or maybe even more important to you than work. And so since work or school is not your sole focus anymore, you just can't meet that standard that you met so well in the past. So the assessment results in four different profiles. Mine was one. Yep. And let's talk a little bit more about mine, not just because it was mine, because I'm sure there's <laughs> many other people out there that are recovering type A, because I'm curious to hear you tell more about not just that profile, but the exercise that you gave. Okay, so actually each type comes with a prescribed exercise. And I'm almost uh, hesitant to tell you what the other types are because I'm afraid that it's going to bias <laughs> when people take the test. You know, so if I tell you these types, then you're going to pick out one maybe and say, oh, I'm probably this type. And then you're going to answer the questions in a way that will make you that type. So I'd rather have people kind of come to the aha themselves. So I'm not going to tell you types. If you feel like it, take, you know, five minutes out of your day and do the quiz. It won't even take you five minutes, but each one does come with an exercise. And so for people who are highly functioning competence or recovering hyper competence, then there is a specific exercise and then one for the, each of the other three types. But what I realized is there's kinds of, there's different driving factors that lead people to be hyper competent. And I can share what some of those are, I think, without telling you the types. Yeah, let's do that. So there's an idea in psychology that everybody has one of three core wounds. And the core wound that kind of fascinates me the most because it's mine is that feeling of never being enough. And so... I think that itself is a big driver of hypercompetence. Let me show you that I am enough by getting one more title and one more accolade and one more A and one more success and show you all my successes so that you'll believe that I'm enough because I'm not really sure I'm enough. So <laughs> that core wound, I think, can really drive hypercompetence. And I've seen it be the case for a lot of highly intelligent, highly capable, wonderful people that I have the privilege to know. Another thing that can be an underlying driving cause of hypercompetence, 
which actually may be linked to the first thing I said, but it's kind of particular in its own way, is if you have been raised by, and I say raised by in the sense of like as a child raised by, or also in the career world came up under, or you currently work for a narcissistic person, that can drive you to become hyper-competent for a couple of reasons. One, you want that person's praise, and it's very hard to come by praise from a narcissist if you know them over a long period of time. Like by definition, and again, I'm not a clinician, but my understanding is and my experience is a narcissist will kind of love bomb you in the beginning, like, oh my gosh, you're the best, you're so fantastic, and then switch and you're the worst. You're not, you, you can't do anything, right? And then you're just trying to get back to that place of feeling approved of and that 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 narcissist boss or parent or whoever is is proud of you. So you'll keep doing more and more and more to try to get back there. The other thing that can happen if you're working with a narcissist or you have been raised by a narcissist is that you will try to make up for their bad behavior on your team or in your family or in your group. You can see that the way the narcissist is behaving is not having a positive impact on people. So you, being the caring person that you are, try to go out of your way to take care of everything to minimize the negative impact that the narcissist has. So that's the two connections to narcissism I've seen that go with the hypercompetence theme. Another one is we can, and this I guess goes back to being a workaholic. I'm not saying all people who are hyper-competent are workaholics, but I can see where these are kind of cousins of each other. Anytime we use a substance or an activity in a addictive way or in a way that's too much for our own good, you know, whether we're drinking too much for our own good or we're shopping too much for our own good or we're working too much for our own good, usually that's because we are at some level running from some scary feelings that we have inside. And hypercompetence can be another way to numb out, like drinking or using drugs or overeating, gambling, you know, there's lots, there's so many, so many things you can be addicted to. And usually people are in that addictive substance because it makes them numb to their feelings. So if I'm so busy checking things off my to-do list and running around and trying to fix everything and show everybody how good I am and how much I'm enough, then I don't have to deal with these feelings I have deep down, whatever they are. Deborah, I have to stop you there because everything you are saying is just resonating so much with me. And I've been in situations where I'm with a friend or a family member and we're talking about this concept of addiction mm -hmm. because it's prevalent out there. The ones that we think of alcoholism, and among highly capable people too. I think yes. I when I was younger, I used to think the only people who have addictions are falling apart and, you know, sleeping under a park bench or something, you know, like not functioning at all. One of my life lessons is how many relatively highly functioning addicts there, there are. are. Yes. We're all kind of numbing out. But I've I've made statements before where someone will say something to me like, wow, you know, you've you've gotten this far in your life without ever falling into these traps. And I say, oh no, it's just that my addiction is socially acceptable. Yep. No one thinks, oh, Heather, you know what? We got to do an intervention with you. You're getting too much done at work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Heather, you have been promoted too many times. You're making us <laughs> look bad intervention time. Yeah, you're right. And we usually get so much praise for being the way we are when we're hyper competent and we can get kind of addicted to that praise too. And that can be another s substance that we end up using again to numb out. The other core wounds also can be drivers for hypercompetence, I believe, based on my anecdotes. <laughs> so again, I'm just always wanting to give you this disclaimer of this is not deeply studied research because I have such respect for deeply studied research. So if someone has a fear, so we talked before about having a fear or having scary feelings, one of the scary feelings can be, I'm afraid I'm not enough. Some other scary feelings can be, 
fears of having to do with scarcity. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to have enough love. I'm not going to have enough approval, which is the not enough one. Or I don't have enough money. Or I'm not going to have enough time. And so if you feel fearful about running out of time or money, that can also drive you to work harder, faster, more. Not necessarily smarter, um, but harder. There's a point at which getting things done becomes not smarter. (laughs) And I think that's what we're talking about now when you aren't feeling joy anymore or you're not feeling other harder feelings anymore. Those are some indicators that you're too competent for your own good right now. And as you were talking about those wounds, I was visualizing this Venn diagram because I could see them overlapping. Yeah, just overlapping. And people are probably listening going, wait, oh, that one too. Wait, yeah, that describes me too. (laughs) It's almost like the human experience sets you up for whatever we want to call them, core wounds, lessons. And we come along here, we're on this journey to discover what all that means for us. And I know for me, there was a point where being hyper-confident didn't serve me anymore, didn't serve me mentally, physically. I was working so hard thinking at some point there will be a break, Mm -hmm. right? I'll just get this degree, then I'll get this degree, then I'll get this job, then I'll get this title, and then I'll be able to have a break. But the realization I had was the more that I worked, the more work there was to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you help people who have this personality trait, many of whom will be in a doctoral program or higher education of some sort? Are the exercises that pop out on that assessment? And by the way, everyone, I'll have the link in the show notes so you can take these 10 questions and see what insights you get. Are those exercises meant to kind of help bring you back into a balanced state? Yes. Although I do think balance in all things is elusive. (laughs) Uh, You know, all kinds of balance could be elusive. But yes, to help you work back towards there. And I don't think anyone stays right at that point of balance. I don't think anything stays right at the point of balance all the time. So the idea of the the exercise is that something that can help you now if you're willing to try it. And I try not to make them more things to do. A lot of the exercises are stop doing things and instead be. Here's a way you could practice being that is not doing the way you really normally think about it. Those are exercises that come with the assessment. But a lot of other things that I do with people during coaching work, leadership coaching work, or crisis navigation work has to do with this theme of hypercompetence. People get so scared to put things down. Well, I know I can't, you know, work nine days a week while I'm also dealing with the fact that my insert loved one's name here is dealing with this huge medical or mental health diagnosis. But if I don't work nine days a week, how will these things happen? And we get so scared not to be as successful as we are sometimes because we're afraid of of what that means in terms of our own value but also it's it's not always that it's also can be you know these people rely on me and if i'm not taking care of these things and those people can't take care of those things and everything's going to fall apart it's a lot of naming and claiming in the conversations that I have with people one-on-one, like, let's talk about what might happen if you don't do this, or what are some ways that it could get done, not by you. Not everything has to be done. And I have to remind myself of this all the time. Yesterday, I had a list of things that I wanted to do. One of the things included forwarding this email that I'd received to a client I have who I thought would appreciate it. Nice thing to do. Right, and then I was looking at my long list of unread emails, and when my emails are unread, that's because I have there's some there's a task in there for me to do. You know, yes, I saw it right away, but I didn't take the action. So one of the actions in trying to clear out my inbox was to forward this guy this email, and I thought I don't need to do that. (laughs) It's a good idea, just because I had the idea. 
It doesn't mean I have to. My goal now is to clear out my inbox as soon as possible tonight so I can turn off the computer and spend time with my daughter. I didn't send the email. It was a good idea. He would have liked it. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm all right. I know it's a silly example because how long does it take to forward an email? But there's so many of those things that can stack up for us. So it's okay to put some things down or to not add things to our list in the first place. And sometimes we need to talk with each other about so the so what of that. Are there any risks? Will any small children die if I don't forward that email? You know, will something horrible befall the earth? Actually, no. <laughs> no. And then there's some things that do need to get done and they are important. And because we're in crisis, we can't be the ones to do them right now. And then we have choices to make about how to handle them without being the one who puts all the time into doing them ourselves. So I'm hearing an underlying message that part of perhaps navigating a highly competent personality is learning to have boundaries and maybe even how to say no along with letting go, would you say? Yes, for sure. Because remember in episode 55 of your podcast, when we talked about the three keys to navigating life's inevitable big challenges, they were communication, community, and capacity. And what we're talking about right now goes to capacity. If you are functioning at your maximum capacity, whatever that is at all times, there's nothing else you can possibly do. So if you're functioning at your maximum capacity and you're in crisis and more things need to get done, you're going to have to, if those more things are important to you, figure out how to either expand your capacity or let go of some of those expectations so that you can make room for other expectations that are more important. Yeah. And you know, you were sharing your, your email story from yesterday and I had a, a situation where my mother's coming into town unexpectedly. And I look around the house and I think <laughs> this needs to be cleaned. And in my head, I'm thinking, even though I have two very capable teenage daughters, I have to do it. <laughs> right? That's the story I've told myself. No one's going to do it as good as I can. Yep. I'm the one that has to clean the house. And I went back to answer a few emails and I came around the corner and my daughter was mopping. And the other one was because I'd shared, hey, Grammy's coming into town. I'm going to need to clean the house tonight. And I thought, wow, I, I don't have to do it. it. It was like this light bulb moment where I thought I can let this go. I can call on my community. Yes. And you know what? They did a pretty good job. And even if it's not perfect, guess what? That's okay too, because you know what that meant? That meant we got to sit down to dinner on time. That meant we got to play a board game instead of me running around trying to make the house perfect. And so I, I really do feel like it is a daily challenge when you have this, whatever, whatever we're gonna call it, a disposition, a way of being in the world. You can't pour from an empty cup is the bottom line and you cannot successfully complete a doctoral program burning the candle at both ends for too long. That is right. That, and that's one of my favorite sayings, a variation of what you just said, which is give from the saucer, not from the cup. And so I have to ask myself, right now I have 50 emails I have to get through before I can close my computer some of these I could just not do so that I can go refill my cup and come back tomorrow and be able to give more. And do you have a favorite self-care practice that you do to help you fill your cup? Mm. One of my favorites is something that I call creative renewal time. Creative renewal is a phrase that I completely stole from my ex-husband because he and his college friends used to periodically host these creative renewal days and everybody would bring something creative to do and they would show each other how to do their things. And I always thought that sounded so cool. But then I kind of stole the phrase and reinvented it for myself. So I have a blog post about it. If anyone wants to learn how to do it, you can search my connect2.com blog. But the idea of it is that you plan to accomplish nothing <laughs> for a period of time. It has to be at least one hour. And you could just do it spontaneously, but people like us probably aren't gonna do it spontaneously, so I sometimes have to put it on my calendar. Then when I show up 
it's three o'clock on Friday and it's creative renewal time. I get to decide what to do right then. And it can't be anything that I feel checks anything off my to-do list. And it can't be anything that drowns out my own inner voice. So I can play with my watercolor markers, but I can't like listen to NPR while I do it or watch a movie because I'm, then I'm focused on that voice and not hearing my own inner voice. I can do anything I want as long as it doesn't check anything off the list and I can still hear my own inner voice even if I'm not paying attention to it. So sometimes that's just sleeping. Sometimes I just fall asleep and it's so delicious. Like I have this free time. I can do whatever I want with. And then sometimes I do something that's more like making art. That's the best self-care to me to make a plan to have no plan and then just do whatever I feel like for at least an hour. It's huge. And I'm going to guess for many people, just the thought of you saying that is causing some discomfort and anxiety. Yeah. What do you mean? Three o'clock on a Friday? You could be doing a lot. Let's discuss. I know. I know. But I need to refill my cup because I have gotten my cup bone dry empty before and then I can't function I get sick like physically sick you know with fever and all this stuff you know because my immune system gets suppressed and then I pick up germs and then I can't work or I get depressed or I get a case of what I call the I don't want us <laughs> where I just not very often in my life these days but every once in a while I kind of wake up with a sense of the I don't want us I don't, I don't want to do all the routine things that I do to have a good life. I don't want to get on the scale and write down my, what my weight is for the day. I don't want to brush my teeth. I don't want to have breakfast. Even, you know, just the most basic self-care things I stop wanting to do. Never mind work on my big work projects or whatever. For me, getting a case of the I don't want us is a sure sign that my cup is getting too empty or it's already been empty for a while. I fully believe in order to successfully navigate a doctoral program, you have to believe you are worth investing in. Yes. And I love this idea of planned nothingness. I know personally, I'm going to find that a challenge, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to get, get out my, I'm going to get out my calendar. I'm going to do it, Deborah. And everyone out there listening, we're giving you permission to do nothing, even if that's a nap, and reap the benefits. Yes, and one of the benefits will be you'll be able to get more done afterwards. So just trick yourself. You say, I'm only doing nothing now so I can get a lot more done next week. Fine, <laughs> because it makes a difference. And you diminish your own capacity when you go and do and overdo and overgive to the point that you're not replenishing. You can stay in hyper-competent, adrenaline-driven, must-get-this-done mode, but you'll actually be accomplishing less and less. Yeah. It. So I love what you said because anyone who has applied to, anyone who was in a doctoral program had to apply to that doctoral program, and somebody said, hey, you're worth becoming a doctoral student here. So you can know if you're a doctoral student, other people have already decided. <laughs> that your work and your being is worthwhile. If you're having any trouble coming to that conclusion for yourself, you can remember that. And then invest in yourself, not only with that education and the career development process you're going through in your program, but giving yourself some time for nothingness as well. I think that's a perfect way to end today's episode, just giving people permission to fill up their cup, get out their day planners or their phones and put an hour in there and get to that assessment. Because I think learning more about yourself and having insight is empowering because then you can recognize, oh, maybe this is my hyper confidence, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe this is something that I can think about and consider when it's impacting your life and ways to change it. Yeah, and I fully believe that if you are hyper-competent, it is a temporary state of being that can be changed and you can change it. No one has to be hyper-competent forever if they don't want to be anymore. And the first step is recognizing it and the second one is a willingness to 
do things a little bit differently so you can have a different outcome. So make that choice. Yeah. Deborah, it was such a pleasure to chat with you today. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Be sure to check out all the links we spoke about in the notes below and the assessment you will find on Deborah's website, connect to TWO.com. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. The Happy Doc Student Podcast is brought to you by expandyourhappy.com, and you can learn more there. Hey, one more thing. Just a quick reminder that the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only.